We hear a lot of perspectives on the Mankind Podcast. Inclusion of a guest is not an endorsement of their views, and the opinions expressed here do not always represent the mission or values of the Mankind Project USA. Looks like the rain has gone. Jeff Lerner, welcome to the Mankind Podcast. So grateful to be here, Brandon. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, mate, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure we were able to put this time together. So, mate, you've done a lot in the world of business, online business. You've got quite a remarkable track record, but I have to start first. You're a jazz man. I am, yeah. I was a professional jazz musician if, in, for most of my 20s. And mm-hmm. I think, you know, kind of once a jazz musician, always a jazz musician. So right, sure. right. So I, had, I just had to get your take on this before we jump into the meat and potatoes. Uh, Rolling Stone released its 250 greatest guitarists of all time, and they did not put Joe Pass anywhere in that Mm. list. Like, in my mind, the greatest solo guitar player in the world, an icon. And, mate, I'm just curious of your opinions of how jazz is often removed from the conversation as it pertains to influence on music. Yeah. Well, so first of all, I mean, were any great jazz guitarists in it i mean was was george benson in it was george Pat benson in was, it? was george benson was not even they left no? out benson they left out benson so to me rolling stone is just i, I yeah. don't even consider them as an author well anymore. so i mean they're they're playing to their audience you know mm-hmm. rock music is uh it's it's emotionally liberated but it's still i would say cognitively contained Meaning like people can get into it because, yeah, I feel all this stuff and I don't have to think that much. Yeah. Jazz is, a, is if anything, I, jazz has more of a, a palette of emotional, you know, liberation relative to constraint. Mm. Like there's more nuance there, but it's like super sophisticated cognitively. And, and it's, it's something you have to work to develop And Rolling Stone, you know, just probably isn't trying to service the audience of people that are, have been willing to do that work. But yeah, I mean, when you are, you know, any serious musician, and this is maybe a self-aggrandizing statement, but I mean, virtually any serious musician will tell you that, like, at least for Western, Western music types, jazz is, is as elite as it gets. Mm. And if Rolling Stone doesn't want to honor that, like, like, like I told you before the show, I've <laughs> wrestled with my ego enough that I'm not going to choose to be offended by that. <laughs> sure, sure. Most certainly. Well, I'm going to put that aside. I had to kind of scratch that geeky itch on, on my end. But my, primarily what I want to dive into with you is your relationship between your entrepreneurial life, the, your, the world of business, which you exist, and your personal life, your family, your marriage. Mm-hmm. You're a father of four. You got your wife, Jacqueline, who I know you do a lot of work with uh, and you integrate her into your work. Uh, mate, would just love to start start there and and get your kind of take on the importance of, or, or your opinion on if those worlds can merge, how to do it in a clean way, and how can you also keep it separate when it needs to. So please just take it away. I know there's a lot there in that question. Yeah, that's that's a big bite there. Um, yeah. yeah. So I would say you know it starts with my definition of an entrepreneur. Uh, which is actually the literal translated definition from French to English. The word entrepreneur means adventurer. Mm. Um, it means one who li- technically it actually means undertaker, but in, a, in English that means like has all to do with like the death industry. Sure. And uh, but but it means like one who undertakes a quest or an adventure. Mm. So adventurer is kind of the closest literal translation. And so using that definition, I my goal is to live a life where all parts are integrated into the adventure. Like I don't want to adventure is what we, I believe we are called to live. We are like, like, honestly, if you ask deep enough questions, eventually you get to the point where either, either I'm here choosing my own adventure, living according to some sort of teleological design or purpose for which I was placed on this earth. Like there's gotta be some framework for fulfillment or else fulfillment becomes abstract and meaningless and to each their own. And we could all kill each other and say, well, I was fulfilled with that. I mean, like there has to be some standards that, that we don't get to choose. Um, and so when you ask for me deep enough questions, you eventually get to where it's just like, am I, 
and by the way, this is affirmed by uh, mortality science, like palliative care. They've done these surveys of palliative care doctors to basically say like, hey, what do we learn from dying people? And they all say the number one regret of the dying is basically I lived someone else's life or I lived someone mm -hmm. else's agenda or I lived according to someone else's decisions. I wasn't true to myself. Wow. Even that concept of true to myself, there must be something for which myself is true. Otherwise, it just becomes everything relative to everything else and it, nothing means anything, right? So like mm -hmm. even this concept of living a life that's true to myself, I would define as living the adventure that you were designed for and that you're called to. And as soon as you do that, why would you want to have any part of your life that's excluded from the adventure, right? Now, right. why wouldn't you say, hey, we're all here to live an adventure. Let's see if our adventures align. Let's figure out how to align our adventures because ostensibly we love each other and we don't want to be alone. And let's live this aligned adventure. And and so like when you take that approach to life, I I actually think like a bifurcated life is basically the source of like most mental distress, mm -hmm. right? When you can wake up every single day and look at your schedule and say, hey, every moment of my day is completely congruent and aligned with my values and my ideals and my grounded principles that I've grounded myself to intentionally through identity and consciousness and spirit and whatever, rather than just what somebody else installed when I was a kid. And I've mm -hmm. never questioned, like, I don't even know how to be depressed at this point mm -hmm. because I've done some incredibly difficult work to get to where that I can say that to be most, almost entirely true of my life. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. a, there are a few things I don't want to have to do, but, and by the way, my life is like really hard. Like by no means is this about comfort and ease and and laziness like i choose an adventure that is is at times even quite perilous and i found i mean it, you talk about integration i found a spouse who i was able over time to enroll into this idea that life is an adventure we have kids you know ki kids are an easy sell on life as an adventure and let's all do it together and now that we have this sense of life as an adventure where we're essentially accountable to ourselves, each other, and God. And, and it, 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 I don't know. I mean, I, could, I can go into lots more detail than that, but fundamentally, that decision steers all other decisions. Right. For me. Sure, certainly. Uh, to me, I hear it coming back to the fulfillment piece. Right. It's, it's not necessarily a, a quantitative metric, but a measure in some in some. Yeah, so sense. it's interesting you say that. Um, so first of all, I, yes, I use the word fulfillment a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I use it enough that I have to clarify so that people actually understand me, what I mean. I'm, I'm a big fan of actually knowing what words mean and where they source from. There are so many words that in the last hundred years, Western English speaking society has divorced from their original meanings. And, I mean, I, I could rattle off a few. For example, the word nice, sources from the old English word for dumb. Um, and we say, oh, you're not nice. No, you're not. You're actually supposed to be nice. You're supposed to take a stand. Speaking of stand, the word profession has come to mean what we do to make money. It means our stand, what we stand for in the world, our profession of faith, our profession of virtue, our profession of principle, right? Um, another such word is fulfillment. We think of fulfillment as like a feeling Fulfillment is about alignment with our destiny. The old English word fulfill on stands, me, means prophecy or destiny. And we are fulfilled to the, degree, to the degree that we've aligned with what we were placed on this earth to do. They used to burn people at the stake for, uh, for, for even referencing this idea, the fulfillment, right? Uh, speaking of weird, the word weird, we think that's a bad thing. Weird means having prescience about the future. It comes from weird. Uh, uh, which I think is a Nordic word. And they used to burn people at the stake for that too, right? They say, oh, you're weird. You can see the future. And they're like, no, I, I choose. The word weird actually means the ability to control one's own destiny. Trust me, you want to be weird in this world. So like I say all that as a grounding for like when you really understand what words mean, you're able to tap into essentially call it ancient wisdom, Wisdom that was formulated through deep thought and deep shared experiences amongst people 
who had the ability, frankly, to think much more deeply and to share and experience as much more richly than we do now, because we're so cognitively fractured now, we, we don't give ourselves the time and the space. We're not allowed the time and the space. And so I use words to access, in my experience, truth. And truth points me exactly toward this idea. Life is an adventure. And, and you mentioned fulfillment being uh, quantitative. There actually are quantitative metrics of fulfillment. The, um, the, the most obvious one that comes to mind is called the Life Satisfaction Index. If, if somebody wants to Google LSIA metric, Life Satisfaction Index Type A, it's basically a way of apprising our own life, I should say appraising our own life, uh, to say, based on expansive thought of what is possible for me compared to what is presently real for me, on a scale of one to 10, how close is what is real to me equal to what is possible for me? Hmm. And I think the average American is like a six. Or, say, wow. or let's let's say, um, but also as you help people experience expand their sense of what's possible and do like consciousness and visualization work and 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 even very practical coaching of like well let's let's set a goal and work backwards and reverse engineer it as you raise the bar in people's minds of what what's possible they actually uh, their life satisfaction index goes down because their present reality hasn't shifted it's actually gotten smaller in in proportion to what's possible. But there's ways to measure this, and perhaps more importantly, there's ways to work on it and raise that score. Oh. And that's literally what I do with my entire life now, is help people raise that score. Help people raise that score. I'm curious, because each of the words that you brought up had a, uh, an implication of getting burnt at the stake, uh, if you were to even acknowledge them or bring them up. Yeah. How much of that cultural impact of that time do you feel like has... Uh, stuck around to today, which may then knock onto people, perhaps thinking a little bit smaller, not thinking about what their potential could be. Um, I mean, just, I would say, just ask our nervous systems, right? Like we still get scared to speak in front of other people. Hmm. I mean, we all say, oh, that's the, you know, people's greatest fears are death and speaking in front of other people. Do we realize how ridiculous that is? Now I'm not judging anyone for it. Our you know, limbic systems in our brain are, are wired through thousands of, of years or if not generations of lived experience, because for most, you know, Ayn Rand said civilization is the process of setting man free from men. That historically, and she she talks about the savage or tribal societies, and she uses some politically off color language. Um, that, you know, isn't how you would describe it now, but that basically for most of human existence, acceptance within the tribe yes. was, was, was safety. Yeah. It was lit or, or the lack of acceptance within the tribe was death. Certainly. And so it's no wonder that we've, we've so deeply wired these two things together, but I actually believe, you know, even if you get, I talk about deep questions, you get to the question of why man, why mm -hmm. sentient life, why a life that is capable of imagination and spiritual questioning and philosophizing and rhetoric and and even and, and and even you can look at evolutionary biology to understand that we were meant to become this way even when you look at you know how and, and i mean to, to sort of like set up a point i've what I, the way i've just chosen my life is by stitching together as many things that i know to be true as possible to try to figure out why so what i'm about to explain is an example of that so when you look at the evolutionary biology of of a mammal species giving birth to an upright, you know, Homo erectus became Homo sapiens. The first move was to stand upright, Homo erectus, to stand erect, right? And so you look at how we evolved. A lot of people don't know this, but compared to all other mammals, every life, every human birth is basically an abortion because we only gestate in the womb about half as long as all other mammals. Like if we were for us to be ready to be born by the same standard as like dogs and horses and primates, we should be in the womb for about 18 months. Why do we get spit out nine months into the process? Because our heads are so big that we would literally split the woman in half if they waited until 18 months to birth us. Well, why, so why, why is that? Why did God or source or universe or whatever you want to attribute it to? Why did he hijack biological evolution and say, let's create a mammalian species that's so malformed that it'll kill the host to try to give birth at the appropriate time 
but that's okay because we'll rewire the endocrine system to initiate birth half prematurely halfway through the process. Why? Because we're meant to have big heads, because we're meant to have big brains, because we're meant to, and the two areas of the brain that take up the most space that literally require this whole hijacking of biology are our language processing and our ability to hold vision in our mind. So therefore, imagination and communication are literally the reasons that biology was hijacked. Therefore, that must have something to do with why we're on this earth. Well, we're meant, you know, communication allows us to do more and more complex reasoning and create more and more complex projects. But this idea of pairing it with vision and visualization, the old the ability to see things in our mind, it takes a lot more neural circuitry to see something in our mind that doesn't exist than to see something out there that does to simply observe. So if we're meant to use communication and visualization as our primary faculties as human beings, then that implies a very specific type of life, which I would call an adventure, a collaborative adventure that we're all meant to come together to do. And so if you believe that that's the teleology of man, it's the mankind project, I assume we, you guys ask why, why all this, right? If you agree as I do, that that is, that is the, the arc that we're meant to live on, that is about transcending all of this old anthropological bullshit that keeps us grounded in fear and tribalism and cultural divisions. And so then you get into this like utopian nirvana ideas and I'm not gonna try to take it all the way there, but like, damn it, we are meant to do the work our entire life to be better than what we're afraid of. <laughs> well done. <laughs> thank you. Uh, clearly you've got thank a, you very much i think you've got a, a passion for this uh well mate i'm i'm, I'm learning more than, than i signed up for so this is hmm. this is really cool this is really neat so to pull some threads from that and by, by the way my wife agrees which is why it works <laughs> so, to, to go all the way back to your original question until she does it doesn't yes no no <laughs> yeah and that by the way the art, I would say in many ways, the art of manliness based on some, let's allow a little bit of traditionalness in the definition of that, is learning how to have conversations like that with the fairer sex. So interesting. Who, who wants secure, who still is wired for security because they want to protect their babies. Hmm. Well, let, let's go, let's go to marriage this quickly because I want to get your thoughts on, I mean, you've worked with tens and hundreds of thousands of students. Uh, through your work, I'm sure many of which have been in intimate relationships or desired to intimate relationships. How much do you believe someone's, uh, what was that life score you mentioned before? Uh, life, they, life satisfaction index. Life satisfaction index. How much do you think that score raising or rising is attributed to finding the right partner to share this journey with? Oh, I think it's actually, I don't know if I'm going to go say it's the most, it's mm. dang near the top of the most important decisions a person will make in their entire life. Mm. And we, and we enter into it on such a fickle basis, usually, which is how we feel. Mm. And I'm not saying that emotion isn't a good data point, but it should not be the, the entire basis for that decision. Well, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of research that suggests that financial success is also marriage is a very important you know, decision on that as well. And so there's all these factors that play into it just outside of feeling, correct? Well, let me ask you, what was it about, uh, and Jacqueline or Jacqueline? How am I? Uh, Jacqueline. Jacqueline. How, what was it about Jacqueline that just, boom, caught your attention? Feelings and all that you just went, oh, um, mine. <laughs> well, I was first attracted to her from about 100 yards away. So we'll, we'll skip past that obvious visual, visual trigger. Um, if I were to say, why do Jacqueline and I work so well? I was literally, I literally told her this for my part. I told her this last night. I view her as such an amazing person. And even, and that term amazing, like amazement, I use in a very specific context of like, it's almost like a sense of wonder, right? Oh, I'm in awe of her abilities to build love and connection with other people. And, and I would call spiritual safety with other people. Like people, when they talk to her, they feel mm. loved. They feel spiritually safe. Uh, and I'm so in awe of that ability because connection is what I'd so deeply desired my whole life. And I felt very marginalized for most, for much of my life. 
that that feeling that that produces in me, which by the way, I have developed and I have to consistently reinforce by what I choose to focus on. She has quirks that bug the shit out of me that I could choose to focus on. Mm -hmm. But instead I keep returning to this sense of wonder around some of what she's able to do with other people. That, that, that experience of wonder when I, when I think of her makes me want to be qualified for this relationship. And so because I choose to hold her in such high regard and because I, I actively orient my consciousness toward that which reinforces holding her in high regard, not, not blithely or, or, or as if to, to whitewash, you know, prob problems. It's more mm -hmm. just like a full reckoning. Every human being has like internal splendor that you can choose to observe and focus on. And I do that so much with her. It creates this incredible lift to my willpower of like, well, we'll do, do I need to do my part to be worthy and qualified of such an amazing partner, right? And so she is the source of so much of my striving in that sense. And by the way, I would, I would, I, I think in that sense, she's a proxy, and this may sound a little weird, but in that sense, she's a proxy for God because I see a lot of God mm -hmm. through her, through the way she loves people. Because yeah. like, you know, Same. she's a, she's a great mm -hmm. practitioner of that. But yes. then on the inverse, her father who who in a very real sense was her God before she found God, was an underground coal miner who after 20 years in the mine, after he saw his best friend die in a mining accident, he, chose, he said, I'm leaving the mine for my family, for myself. And he struck out as an entrepreneur and lived this very quixotic, very difficult entrepreneurial adventure because he... He, he would do virtually anything to not have to go back to the coal mine where he saw his friend die after 20 years. And because she saw her, the most, the strongest imprint she ever made in a human relationship in her, in her entire life was through her father. And she saw him as this juxtaposition between a life of, I mean, I mean he wasn't a slave, but being an underground coal miner is pretty damn close to slavery. And this juxtaposition of that possible existence versus, no, I'm leaving. I'm literally taking off my hard hat, putting down my spotlight, and I'm leaving this mine, and I'm going to go face the dragons and whatever life holds for me and build this entrepreneurial alternative path that everybody in my life is saying, I'm crazy, I'm reckless, I have a family. Right. I should status keep, I status should. quo breaking. This is not And what she saw do. that, and she holds that in high regard. Therefore, mm. she aligns with someone like me. Right. And so it works because at this deep level, we're aligned. And I'm going to say, this is my third marriage. Mm -hmm. It's also my last marriage. There is not a shred of doubt about that in my mind mm -hmm. because I found the one that, again, I, that I was, I align with at almost like a, like a preternatural level. And, and so now a lot of what I counsel people is like, Hey, before you move any relationship forward, let's do some really cool intimacy work. And by the way, the word intimacy means to make known, to increase the level of familiar familiarity. It doesn't mean, you know, in, to be intimate in, in that sense. Let's do some intimacy work to really figure out how compatible you guys are. Because if you get that right, you can truly go have an adventure together. I can't disagree there, certainly, because a lot of the uh, greatest steps that me and my wife have taken since we've gotten together have been when we have carefully created a shared vision. Like mm. we have a shared vision, a shared mission, you know, having children, like you said, is a pretty great influence on, on all the above, but we've learned that getting out of that kind of individual thinking, it's so natural. Like when you talk about things like unlocking potential to go into an I, a me, a self kind of thought. And with that comes, the strengths that you know, the strengths that you don't, the weaknesses that you're probably very familiar with, and then all the resistance and story that gets mm -hmm. in the way of, of action. But putting that aside and going, sure, that's, let's just say a thing, but we, us, what is possible there? And, and we are dangerous when we have goals, like dangerous. It's amazing the abundance that we bring in when we have that shared vision, we have that intimacy, we bring up the things and learn the, the facets of one another as 
her traumas come up, as my traumas come up, as you know, we start to color in the picture of where we both came from and what we're creating together. Too true. I mean, I can only speak from my experience and you, sir, are the authority here, but of how professional success follows when I find, found someone like Christine, my wife, who, you know, she's Christian, I'm not. And yet when I see her, I see the only person I've ever seen who could be in lockstep with Jesus, with someone like that. Hmm. Most of the, what I judge pious folks around here, I'm in the South, right? I'm in the, the buckle of the Bible belt. Mate, they can't hold a candle to what I've heard or learned about Jesus. And my wife's the only one that can. And through that reverence, through that awe, through that admiration, it makes me, yeah, want to step up, want to level up. And to that point as well, any professional inroads I want to make, or if people come to me wanting to hire me for consultation or the rest, it's always the same thing for me. I'm going to go talk to my wife about it. Yeah. You know, this is yeah and- how, how does this knock on to the us, to the vision we're creating together? Yeah. Oh, completely. No, I, I'm so, I'm so aligned with you. And what I found is the more I sort of, I'll say unreasonably insist. uh, One of my favorite quotes is the unreasonable man. I think it's George Bernard Shaw. All, what, what does he say? The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable man persists in trying to adapt the world to himself Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. So mm. when I say unreasonable, I mean it as like one of the highest uh, level, you know, highest levels of adjective that I could apply to anything. So, so in, in a very unreasonable sense, one of the commitments that I've made, one of the values that I've installed into my life, and I can talk a little bit more about the, mm. the, the values, vision, strategy, tactics, hierarchy, or pyramid, but one of the values I've installed in my life is this, this value of, of integration and congruency where my shared vision, I love that term, my shared vision with my wife, which she is every bit of, as much a part of as I am. And that, that, by the way, for some men is step one is actually surrendering to the idea that somebody else is going to get a, a stake in your vision. And it's going to be just as important as your stake. Bingo. But that having done that, I'm like, everything needs to feel completely congruent and aligned with us not just with me. Because as a business guy, I know how to do deals from my left brain. I know how to be quantitative. I know how to be almost, almost like rigid and robotic Hmm. and, and, you know, all business, right. It's just, just, uh, you know, bottom line, uh, almost like an accountant. I know how to do that. I don't like the way it feels to do that, but I have to actively resist a lot of things that come my way that I know I could be drawn into but it wouldn't draw us into it. And, and, and that suddenly I would have this, this dissonance, this schism in my life. And so I have found, and, and this is what I found, and this, this is something I've discovered through taking the risk of trying to be the same way in my professional life that I am in my personal life, which is a risk for most people, right? Sure, sure. You know, I, I cry. In my personal life, I cry sometimes. A lot of people, I can't let my, my coworkers see me cry. Well, like if your kids and wife can see it, then that's authentic to you. you. You're allowing a divergence to exist in your life. And so, you know, I cry or I talk about values or I share my faith. Like there's mm-hmm. things I've taken the risk to bring into my professional life. And my, it, it just keeps getting better and better and better. Like, I don't know what to mm-hmm. say, except I make more money than I ever did. I have more fulfillment than I ever did. I'm a better leader than I ever was. I attract better people to do business with than I ever have. Like all the professional boxes keep getting checked and elevated the more I take us into everything. Well, thank you. Thank you. Because authenticity has become one of those words in the professional world, kind of like integrity. It's just like a throwaway term Mm -hmm. now. It's in everyone's mission statement, yet people can say the word, they can logically use their left brain to explain it, right? But have they embodied it? Have they integrated into their lives? And for me, being in men's work, we attract a lot of, you know, very uh, success oriented individuals uh, that have that challenge. They've created a persona for their business life. They've yeah. shoved whatever character and natural pieces of themselves down that they judge to be dangerous or not effective in them achieving their professional goals. And then so they create this mask. Yeah. It's, hey, love the mask. Do business with the mask. 
right? And yet, when they go from the boardroom to the bedroom, oftentimes have challenges taking that mask off. What am I doing here? Which persona am I using here? Am I dad right now? Am I C-suite executive right now? Am I husband right now? And it's like, dude, that's exhausting. That's exhausting to try and check yourself and think, where am I in this moment? Now, personas are judged to be helpful and beneficial when you got to pick up that phone <laughs> and dial it a hundred times right. right before the end of the day. However, if you can create an environment, a team, a culture that allows tears to fall and go, Jeff, don't wipe those tears, mate. They're welcome here. Let them fall. Let them sit there on your cheek because we want all of you here in this organization, knowing that you are a sum of many parts and many experiences. And in order for us to be successful, for you to be successful, we want all of that to come to the table. And what a freeing way to live to know that, hey, I don't need to put that mask on. I can just be Jeff. I can just be Brandon in whatever environment. And if someone doesn't like it, then I don't think we have a good match here. Yeah, I I, I mean, and there's like that word authentic. Um, you're right. It's It's become so cheapened. But the, the word authentic comes from the Greek word, I think it's Greek, for principle, but not uh, P-R-I-N-C-I-P-A-L. Not, not principle no. like a principle, but yeah. principle like the principle principle, the yes. first, the foremost. Yes. So there's actually only one authentic, on authenticity. The word itself tells us. It means the original, the principle, the yeah. authentic, right? And so when you understand that, I, I, I love this distinction you use between masks and personas. Mm -hmm. um, I use, we, we use, a, in my world, I use a language called, sometimes called success, your success character, sure. which is like this, your success character isn't a mask. It's not this thing you actively seek to develop that is, that is not who you are. It's actually the most you that mm -hmm. you can be. It's just, it, it it most people's nervous systems actually haven't acclimated or and haven't been managed mm -hmm. with intention to the point where they can actually handle being fully themselves all the time right and it's and, it, and it's most of it i mean fundamentally the the self protection mechanism the the amygdala fear response and the sympathetic nervous system of adrenaline and cortisol mm -hmm. and you know the hormones and the brain chemistry it all kicks in when when we feel threatened and the most we ever feel threatened is when our nervous system is threatened. It's actually the most mm -hmm. critical life system is our nervous system, right? And so the fact that we don't know how to effectively manage our nervous systems results in all of these fear-based compensation mechanisms that are fundamentally just ways of handling our nervous system. Survival right? mechanisms. Right? It is, yeah. And so, so when I use the term success character, what I'm really saying, the, the technical, perhaps less helpful explanation is that version of myself that has a, a regulated nervous system that such that it allows me to be completely myself all the time. And since most people aren't there yet, and it can be a lot of work to get there, depending on how much trauma you've experienced, Sure. the success character is an opportunity to kind of step into that, knowing full well you have permission to step out of it if it gets overwhelming. But like when you've got a big sales presentation or you're about to give your TED talk or you're about to, you know, meet with the CEO, like you don't want to be putting on a mask. You want to be elevating into your highest, most authentic self, even if it's just for a time because you haven't learned to stay there all the time. Yeah, exactly. And you also could be going through a divorce or a schism in relationships and, and you still have a responsibility to your stakeholders, to your employees, to mm -hmm. be able to turn up and do right. a deal. Right. So you, yeah. So you can kind of lean on that success character, um, knowing that it is but, a part of you, but when, when the time necessitates, right? Yeah. I really like that you brought up an example of like a, a life, a life event. Uh, my friend Bruce Feiler calls them our transitions, right? Those, mm -hmm. those life events, that are, are demar points of demarcation for, from which there's a before and an after, and we know they're not the same, right? Sure. Um, to be able to go to your coworkers, let's, let's use that as an example, and say, mm -hmm. hey, I'm going through a divorce right now. And honestly, it's, it's messy, it's brutal, it's ugly, and it's, and it's, it's going to be protracted. Like, it's not going to wrap up next week. So I can either hide it from all of you guys, 
or I can try to figure out what is the most authentic, real, effective version of, of myself who is still really, really great at his job and also going through a really painful divorce. Like yeah. there's a version of me that I'm going to have to to dial in and it's probably going to be clumsy and take a little bit of work. But I want you guys to know that I don't want, I know that it'll be bad for me and bad for you. If I have to shove this down and keep it a secret, I also know that it'll be bad for me and bad for you. If it's all I ever talk about and I'm always puking my divorce stuff all over you, but there's this finely calibrated version of me that is, is grieving and suffering, but also showing up to do this amazing work that I committed to do when I took this job. And I appreciate you guys bearing with me as I find that. Because the one thing I don't want to do as I go through this, because I don't want to do the disrespect to you or to this work, is to not be truly who I am. Oh, well said. Well said. Well, that, that's emotional intelligence right there. It's the ability, you know, having that self-awareness, making it known, right? Because that which gets hidden doesn't get healed. Not saying it's your coworker's mm -hmm. job to heal it. Uh, but it gives him the ability to go, you know what? Maybe Jeff shouldn't be pitching this week. <laughs> Let's check right. back in and see how he's going. And then we'll put him in charge. Yeah. And one. it's, it's right. interesting. I, I know that, that, you know, the mankind project, you guys are, are very grounded in like these, these convert, these, let's call them anomalous conversations, conversations that men don't have very often. I mean, I, the way I just articulated that, I feel like if somebody, if somebody didn't like that, I came to work and had that conversation, that would be a, a data point. That's like, Hey, that, that person, they, they're having their own stuff going on. But like, frankly, I'd probably go to the boss and be like, Hey, I, this, this person seems really misaligned with authenticity. Is this consistent with our culture or whatever? Like mm -hmm. that would be a data point that I would probably respond to at some level. Bingo. But honestly, it sounded very reasonable to me when I said it, that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yet I suspect most men would struggle to visualize themselves having that conversation. Oh, I mean, most men would never want it to be known or let it see the light of day. Yet a lot of men suffer in silence. Hence yeah. why we're four times more likely to take our lives. Right. And there's this male malaise that's impacting men of all ages across the entire globe right now. That's, <laughs> they don't want to get up and go. Right. They don't want to be able to change their circumstance. Or maybe they do, but they're overwhelmed yeah. with what that looks like because we are raised in a culture that boxes us into men don't share their feelings. Because if they do, they're a girl, they're a sissy, they're right. gay. They're all these things that we use to police each other in preschool that still happens today. But it's a self-narrative that's more powerful than, than what we heard growing up. Yeah, and I think the I think the the challenge is that like now there's like there's a counterpoint to that, which is like no men do share their feelings, like evolve and like go listen to you know the Mankind podcast or the Dad Edge podcast or whatever, and like uh, the Art of Manliness. Actually, I, I don't I haven't listened to that one that much. It may be manly, manly, or it may be like holistic manly. I don't know. It's but a anyways. Resource. It is. I bet, okay, I cool. Yeah. I batch for it. Yeah. Um, but you know, but still men are like, oh, okay. I'm, I'm again, it, it, it turns into a, I'm supposed to, oh, I'm supposed to also be this way. So now I have this way. That's like my, my legacy inheritance of male reductionism of like men are supposed to be this way. Mm -hmm. And then there's this new thing that apparently I'm also supposed to be. And they're totally at odds. Yeah, it's and it's all this conversation about like, well, there's this one external thing I'm supposed to map to, but now there's this other external thing I'm supposed to map to. And they don't, they don't align with each other. So now I don't, I don't know what to map to. And it's like, bro, you don't need a map to anything. It's all already inside you. The yes. authentic self already has all these capacities. And so I think the, the, the source to me in a lot of ways of this male malaise is Again, it's this inherited anthropological backstory of men looking to the tribe for validation yes. based on their role or their function or their job title or their, I'm the, am I the chief or am I the medicine man yeah. or am I the warrior or yeah. am I the kangaroo groomer or like whatever, instead of like, <laughs> am I me? Hey, Boyson. Brandon, what's happening, man? Right. I'll tell you, little one. My daughter, she is becoming more and more her, bindi, which bindi, is bindi. amazing. I'm just eating it up. But when I don't want to eat it up is in the middle of the night, <laughs> four in the morning when she's trying to skip naps and I've got a lot of things to do. That's when things get a little tough. So what are you leaning on? I mean, yeah, right. 
I get that. How much coffee are you drinking these days? Well, mate, you know me. I'm certainly not. I don't like the vices. You know, I've been in the health space for a while, and I, I get a little bit too hooked on those things. So I'm pretty grateful that we uh, we had the folks at Magic Mind reach out to provide us and the audience some value with their Magic Mind drink solution. And dude, I can tell you, it is blowing my mind. What's it doing for you? I'll talk about mine, but what's it doing for you? Well, mate, I think the biggest thing is sustained energy. That's what I need. I need to have the same energy at 10 a.m. as I do need at 2 p.m. But when the energy dips and I've still got work to do and she's crawling all over me, screaming in my ear, that is when I need to be able to push through. And yeah, so I'm not getting the dips. And unlike coffee, I'm sleeping at night, which is amazing. Yes, the ingredient thing. So that's that's me too. I've been a coffee dude for a very long time. And when I get into these spaces where I'm just working, 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 and I get too much into the coffee, I end up like frazzled and stomach achy and jittery. And what I'm seeing with Magic Mind is like, I've reduced the amount of coffee I'm actually drinking in the morning and magic mind boosts the focus for me. So for me, it's like, how many things can I juggle in a day and having that focus without the coffee stuff, without all the coffee downside, I think has been really good for me. And yes, the sleep thing, man, some, what, what, there's some ingredients in this stuff that have totally helped my sleep. Mm -hmm. absolutely well i mean because you're getting the caffeine from matcha which is an extended release caffeine as opposed to like an intense rise then dip it's got all the fancy mushrooms that you know everyone's taking these days including ashwagandha which gives you that mm, mas fuerte kind of energy and uh they're off and fortunately for us they've offered us a great discount that us and you the listeners have access to to get 56 percent off your first subscription and 20 percent off a one-time purchase with the unique discount code mankind so if you go to magicmind.com forward slash mankind you get access to this discount and like us you get to enjoy this sustained energy that mass fuerte energy um, i can take that to a couple places but uh yeah <laughs> big and, fans and do yes check so check it out yes yeah, and I need to get my wife to stop stealing mine, which would be great. <laughs> Thanks, Brandon. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Because, yeah, I think that's why we see a rise of the Andrew Tates of the world that are, you know, attracting lonely, isolated, angry men. And nothing bands people together more than a common hatred of something else, whether it's the right. Matrix, whether it's feminism, whether it, whatever the target is. It negates doing the work. Yeah. Do your effing work. All right. Who are you? That's why, you know, we're the world's largest nonprofit that supports men in this way. And there was no one in leadership in this organization who should ever utter the words, this is what it means to be a man. Is what does it mean for you to be a man? Yeah. You and all the nature and nurture, you and all your uniqueness, you and all the life experiences, the aces, all the things that you've been through in your life. What does it mean for you? Because the second we start getting into this narrative of you have to be this way, boom, we've just put you back in a box. Yeah, and we, we, we that, that externality, I mean, it's the hardest thing, especially because men, even our orientation is, as call it breadwinners, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially, earning a living is fundamentally about exchanging approval for money. Like I'm, it's not, it's not that I'm doing this work, it's that I'm doing this work that you approve on, mm -hmm. therefore you'll keep paying me to do this work or, the, or that you approve of, right? And that idea of trading a, approval for money as the core of what our job is in this world keeps us so locked into this external orientation that, that can be okay to a point, but as soon as approval from others in exchange for money starts to misalign with approval of my approval from myself based on my authentic orientation, which you reference nature and nurture to some degree, I have choice in, but to a large degree, I don't because most of it was, was installed. Some of it came pre-installed from the factory when I was born mm -hmm. and the rest of most of it was, or most of the rest of it was installed by the time I was 10 years old through my life experiences. Yes. And now that I'm trading approval for money as the quote breadwinner, 
if what I'm trading isn't aligned with nature and nurture, it is literally impossible that I'm ever going to feel fulfilled. Mm. Mm. Th that's been, that's been very true for me, uh, navigating with the birth of our daughter. She turns one next, next year. And, and I told myself this story forever that I wanted to be a stay at home dad. And there were many external factors I think that informed that choice and that belief. And having spent the past year, you know, working on my various, like we've got the podcast, I teach at the university, I've got a couple streams, I do consulting uh, within and around that, that identity as a stay at home father. Uh, I've had to butt up against that, that mm. narrative, like that cultural mm. narrative that like, who are you as a man, if you're not going home and bringing home the bacon, if you're not going out and hunting and feeding your tribe. And at the end of the day, my wife and I had a conversation and this was the best thing that we decided for our child to not put her in daycare, to not miss those magic moments in those first couple of years. This is what we came to. And not to say there isn't challenge, but we keep checking back in. She's now thinking she might want to pull back from work. And I'm sitting here going, great. I would love to get my hands on something a bit more having come from, you know, building mm -hmm. and selling a business. It's this, it's not fixed. It doesn't have to be fixed. So, I'm curious, like, are there seasons in which for you and Jacqueline that you, you kind of shift those energies, you shift those focuses uh, when each new season kind of presents its inherent opportunities and challenges? Oh, my God. Yeah, my goodness. Yes. I mean, seasons, it's interesting. Seasons implies a, a specific sort of cyclical nature. Hmm. And I, I actually am in this moment, I'm not having complete clarity on whether I would call them seasons or stages. Mm. Stages are like linear seasons are like cyclical. Right. And so I'm, I, I, I'm not actually sure which of those distinctions I'm biased towards, mm. except that I will, I do feel like there's ultimately the goal for me. And, and even in, in my framework of what I teach uh, and, and what, what's embedded into Entra, my education platform and, and really all the work that I do in the world is this concept of the three P's and the fourth P. So the three P's are physical, personal, and professional. These are the main areas of life, the dimensions along which we develop. And then the fourth P is called purpose, well, is purpose. Like what's our purpose, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and by the way, uh, purpose comes from the French, purpose, that which we propose. So like our purpose is, and again, our purpose and our profession we, we, we even externalize those, but they actually both relate to the same thing. That which I propose, that which I profess, mm -hmm. like, and that's where I think, I mean, you, we open the conversation. I know I'm kind of meandering here, but we open the conversation with that question about it, like the bifurcated distinction between a man's work life and a man's home life. When you understand that your purpose, that which you propose and your profession, that which you stand for are two ways of saying the same thing. The idea of living a misaligned professional life or, or, or doing work that doesn't line up with the rest of who we are, I hope people can understand like this is a fundamental truism. This isn't just an opinion. You cannot be fulfilled. And, and, and if the goal is to die, not regretting the shot that we took, how, how could life ever be anything? If your work life is misaligned from your authentic self, how could there be any more important function in life than to rectify that? Right. But I, I would argue as, and this is one of the great ways that we as men get emotionally hijacked through guilt is to say, well, yeah, but do it for your kids. You still got to feed your kids. You still got to keep a roof over their head. Tr like, like yeah. sacrifice the entirety of your, your most productive, energized working years of your life to do what's responsible for your kids. Yeah. How the hell is it responsible to our kids to show them that our purpose, our profession, our raison d'etre, the reason we are on this earth was always exchangeable yeah. for survival. Those who, you know, Ben Franklin said, those who would trade a little bit of liberty for a false, for a sense of security deserve neither liberty nor security. I believe that is true and I don't believe our families make it untrue. Mm. And I think one way to say it simplified is you pour from an empty cup at the end of the day. It's, you, you, it's I, this, I think it's, you've actually rejected the cup altogether. The cup yeah. is built on fulfillment. Mm. So it, this then brings up this kind of 
quandary and I don't want to go too deep down this path, but this, this whole expectation in entrepreneurship that your profession should be your passion and should be your purpose and all the rest. But for many, that's a huge leap to take cognitively and emotionally to go, well, I have this career that I went to school for that I have, and I have responsibilities and all the rest for the time being, could it just be kind of broken down into, all right, well, this is serving a purpose. It may not be the passion and then just kind of strategically well, navigate. Yeah. So when I talk about stages, fulfilling. yeah, totally. When I talk about stages again, it's, it's, you know, this sort of linear progression. Yes. There is a time perhaps when you have to prioritize income over life satisfaction hmm. and, but, but like, Give but to surrender, yeah, yourself, but to what? surrender to that, to stop yeah. sort of incessantly and unrelentingly pushing against it and trying to see what is, what is the unlock? How do I get to the next stage? It, 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 it's the surrender is the defeat. Right. It's not the conditions you're in. You're putting the hard hat back on and walking into the mine. Yeah. You do what you got to do. He did that for 20 years. Yeah. Right. In that example. So, so yeah, I think it's fine to do what you have to do, but to give up that striving. So there was a study by the Lifeway Institute in 2020. Uh, I don't remember. It was in the thousands. I don't remember how many people they surveyed, but it was in the thousands. It was a, it was a very statistically valid sample group. And and what it found is that 81% of human beings believe that life has a purpose. And only 6% of human beings actually think about the purpose of their life as often as one time per year. Hmm. So if 81% of people believe life has a purpose, and frankly, I think the other 19 ha just haven't agreed, at, haven't agreed yet. Hmm. I actually think it's inevitable. Like it, it may happen on your deathbed, but at some level, when you try to evaluate your life, there has to be some scale against which to measure, hmm. right? Um, and, and so, so anyway, if, but we'll just use 81%. If 81% of people believe life has a purpose and only 6% actually think about it even one time per year as it applies to themselves, it is very obvious that most human beings, it's not that they reject the idea of purpose. They've just given up on the idea of living it out. Hmm. And so, uh, you know, when you, when you accept that most people do believe life has a purpose, it's not a question of let me convince them. It's let me build people. Let me inspire people. Let me create hope for people to think, oh yeah. And by the way, it's not a fool's errand for me to think about how I could do that too. And that's where that incessant striving comes from. And I think that when we trade that for our children, we epigenetically pay forward the worst kind of pain, mm. which is the pain that it would have been better if we'd never been here because either there was no purpose or we didn't live it. So you can grow up to do what your daddy done, right? Oh yeah. I mean, I, how <laughs> many people have been psychologically contaminated by parents who surrendered the idea that their life had a purpose mm -hmm. rather than surrendering to the idea that their life had a purpose? Wow. Well, Jeff, there, oh, mate, I feel like I could spend multiple days <laughs> with you diving into these topics, but with the respect to time, I know that we're, we're coming to the end of our conversation here. Speaking of children, this is the last thing I want to ask you and forgive me. It's, it, we opened with a big bite and then this, this itself may, may very well be a big bite question, but kind of based on the conversation we've had today, knowing that your kids, right, they're on their own journey. They're on their own path. Mm -hmm. uh, Khalil Gibran says that parenthood is about crafting a bow in essence, and you, you create a safe environment. You teach them along the way, you guide them, you help them fail. And all the while you're building this bow that's flexible, but it's strong. It's still firm and mm -hmm. your kids are the arrow and you point them in the best direction. But once you let go of that thing, they're mm. on their own. I love that. What is it? What is it that you want to imbue or impart onto your children? Two things as it pertains to relationships and the person that they're going to choose going forward and then professionally with the integration of the mm. two, what is it that you want to impart onto them? Well, I would say in terms of relationships, it would be, I, I would, I would, I would hope my kids, but not, not in a dogmatic way that they, Oh, well, dad told me this, therefore it's true. But in like sure. an experiential arriving, you know, to give them a suggestive truth of something that mm. opens them to an experience that could validate that truth. Right. Sure. Is that 
the, the love that we experience in relationships, all types of relationships, the different dimensions of love, whether it's eros, agape, philios, like, you know, there's all these Greek words for love that are like, there's brotherly love, there's human love, there's like romantic love, right? All of those dimensions of love are how we actually experience the divine behind our, our existence. And, and I'm not going to say God, because I want to I want to leave a lot more room than that term for, for a lot of people. Like, I'm fine. I, I talk to God all the time. But like, that, like, either there's a purpose or they're not. Albert Camus said, the only serious philosophical question is suicide. Hmm. Either there's a point or there's not. And if there's a point, I'll spend my whole life striving for it. And if there's not, it's pointless. What does it matter? Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's like the first choice. The first choice that begets all future choices is does life ma mean something or not? If not, I might as well spare, you know, save the trees and get myself out of the equation. Or if it does, then now I have some work to do. And as long as I get to live is, is how long I get to do that work. And so I would want my children to hopefully experience that relationships are how we experience our purpose on this earth, how we experience the divine design. And that's why there's all these different cool aspects, types of relationships. Eros, again, Eros, Philios, Agape, let's just start there. Three different dimensions of love energy through which we can experience our divine created purpose. We are on this earth to build relationships. We are on this earth to inspire people. We are on this earth for intimacy, which means, you know, to become familiar, right? To, to, to be better known. Mm. We're on this earth to share. The, the, the root of the word communicate, communicare is the Latin word for sharing. Like it's all in the language why we're here. So that's what I would want them to experience in terms of relationships. And honestly, what I would say, what I want them to experience in terms of their professional life is yes, there's some pragmatic exchanges that have to happen as you, you know, leave the nest and start to pay your own bills. But please, please always understand that the orientation of your professional life is to be able to take the type of impact you can have in your personal life through relationships and through a profession that for which you stand expand that impact to indirect relationships too. That is literally the only point of work. Mm. That creates ripples. Yeah. The world changes. Jeff Lerner, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, so thank you for taking the time. And of course, thanks must go to those of you that join us each and every week for the Mankind Podcast, the show where we break the molds of modern manhood to prove there is more than one way to be a man. What do you say, Jeff? Have we done that today? I... I, I hope so. I, I, I will say I've not experienced that the whole world is aligned with what we're talking about. So there's clearly more work to do. Hey, it starts with a conversation. So mate, thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you for those of you that have listened and we will see you next week. This has been another episode of the Mankind Podcast produced in association with the Mankind Project USA. We have been your host, Boyson Hodgson and myself, Brandon Clift. And we want to thank our guests, for joining us today and imparting their wisdom from their experiences in this amazing journey called life. If you want to find out more about today's guests and support them in their mission, you can find links to them in the show notes. Now, if you have found gold and insights that you believe could benefit your loved ones and those you care about, be sure to share it with them. And of course, we are always grateful for a rating and review of the show on iTunes. Now, above all else, we've got to thank you, the listener. Because through your attention and your support, you have made it possible for us to let men all over the world know that they are not alone and that there is more than one way to be a man. And if something in this episode has touched you, then perhaps it is the call to action to get involved in men's work. With live trainings happening constantly and in-person trainings happening all over the world, the Mankind Project definitely has something for you. Now, if you've enjoyed the music in this episode and all of our episodes, be sure to check out Jim Donovan and the Sun King Warriors. I have links to them in the show notes. And lastly, just know what it means to me to be a man is completely different than what it means for you. That is the beauty of this journey. So if you are looking for guidance, support, and community as you begin to unpack and dive deeper into your men's work journey, then you know where to find us. Same place, same time next week. Lots of love. See you then.